Buddhists, when they put this convention together, they had prophecies that have been fulfilled, prophecies that are being fulfilled, and prophecies to be fulfilled. One, two, three. Well, we did those, and here I am. <laughs> so what we're going to talk to you about is putting that together with the very simple, clear, focused question, what about me? What am I supposed to be in relation to all that I just heard? In relation to all that we'll talk about tomorrow during the panel discussions, who am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to be? What's my role? What's my heart? What's my attitude? What's my focus? What's my direction? Because, brethren, the bottom line is, without the faithfulness of each and every individual church member, Nothing else works. Understand that we, by the grace of God, are in a position to be a part of all of this prophecy. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about that, it makes me a little bit nervous. Because at the end of the age, the call of the church is going to continue to wane it's not what it was back in Brother Russell's day. And that means the responsibilities of that last bit of faithfulness lie on our shoulders. So that's what this hour is about. Many of the scriptures I'm going to quote you've already heard. We have been blessed to hear from Brother David, Brother Harry, and Brother Bob giving us different aspects of the, the, the massiveness of, of, of prophecy. And I have notes I'm going to try to follow them. <laughs> I'm going to try. But, but well, here, here's the problem I'm having. The problem I'm having right now in, in my own little brain is that one of the things that occurs to me that kind of, again, it blows you away. You realize how many prophecies were talked about today? and how long ago they were written, and all the details, and how all of these things have unfolded over time. And here we are being able to look back, look present, and look forward and say, it's already laid out. And yet you're a part of it. It boggles my mind to think of the magnificence of the mind of the Creator. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 to 13, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And that's what Brother Bob talked about at the very, very end. I'm going to try to tie these things in together today with the thought in mind, what about me? What am I supposed to be doing? And how am I supposed to be going about it? So our theme scripture will be, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. This is 2 Peter 3.11. What manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness? This verse reflects a classic action and reaction. It's a process. All of these things being dissolved is the action. What things? Well, well we, you've heard about a bunch of them. We'll, we'll, we'll reflect a little bit. Um, but the, these things being dissolved and falling apart creates the reaction of what manner of persons all ought we to be. What will I be in the context of all of this unrest? Because, you know, as we consider prophecies right now, you think about the kinds of prophecies that are in the process of being fulfilled, and not too many of them are really happy. They're all kind of difficult, and they're all full of turmoil and trauma, and there's a lot of, a, a lot of fighting and unrest and, and, and all of these things. So 
let's figure ourselves out here. Let's define what manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness. The word for holy is the word for sacred. Sacred. Think in terms of our lives being focused in on that which is sacred. The word for conversation, uh, the Greek word, means behavior. The Greek English lexicon says manner of life, conduct, behavior, deportment. It's how I act. Godliness means piety or reverence. So the question is, what manner of people should we be in our sacred conduct and reverence? What manner of people should we be in our sacred conduct and reverence? Well, let's quickly review what things are being dissolved. The current systems and the governments of the earth, that's what are being dissolved. As we review these changes, we'll continually ask the main question that Peter has put to us. So if you've heard talks that I give, I tend to repeat myself a lot. So your question that we want to just plant into your minds is what manner of people should we be in our sacred conduct and reverence? That's the key. So let's put this question that Peter asks into the context that Peter set. He asked the question because he put the context in place and he gives us the answer. Second Peter verse, chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Know, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come, will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? And that's the word for parousia. Where is the promise of his parousia? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Where is the promise of his presence? Everything's going the way it's always gone. Ha! You think you know something. It's the promise of his presence, not the coming. And, and, and some of the brethren touched on this, the, the idea of the coming of, of the, the return of Christ being this moment, this, this magnificent moment that changes everything. It's not it at all. It is the presence that changes everything. There is mockery when you hold things that require faith because we look in the past and we see how the Lord has planted these things. And mock mockery, if you've noticed, has become an art form in our world now. It's very easy to mock. As a matter of fact, it's almost a contest. Who can mock the others better? And we, we live in this world where mockery is just, is, it has elevated and it's just part of life. It's been 150 years since our Lord's return. And we are in the stage where people who hear that and think, well, <laughs> well, sure, great job he's done. They have no idea. They have no idea, no idea of how these plans unfold. What manner, when, if you, I don't know if you've ever faced mockery while standing for truth. It's not fun. Had it happen. But the question is, what manner of persons what manner of people should we be in our sacred conduct and reverence when these things happen? Those who mock, and here's the thing, those who mock only see what's in front of them. Peter acknowledged this, acknowledges this and explains in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. He goes on and says, for when they maintain this, when they maintain their mockery, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water and through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. So what he's saying is, mockers don't bother to see the greater context of what they're mocking. And when it comes to God's truth, as revealed in the scriptures, it is easy for people to mock it. It is easy. You know, just a quick, very, very quick side note. I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, with, with, the, with the Christian Questions Witness work, we, we, we get a lot of emails. And we've gotten emails recently from individuals uh, involved in witchcraft. 
And these emails are, in a sense, a little bit mocking. We, we did a whole series on, on witchcraft, a very, very detailed series of one email we got was somebody saying, well, at least you didn't condemn everybody. You know, uh, but this last one was, who do you think you are telling me I can't have a relationship with Jesus? Now, this is a, a, somebody who says that they're a witch. And so, you know, you're thinking about all of this, and the, the mockery comes because they just don't understand. And when we receive mocking, our response ought not to be to mock back. It ought to be one of compassion and sometimes even pity to say, it's okay. It's okay. Because you know what? Jesus died for you too. And you'll see. You'll see. So going back to 2 Peter, he talks about the world that was being destroyed. How did it escape their notice? How did it escape their notice? Because they're not looking for that. They don't want the answer. They just want to mock. Matthew 24, 37 to 39, uh, Brother David's quoted this from the uh, Young's Literal Translation. As in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the presence of the Son of Man. For as they were in the days before the flood, eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage till the day Noah entered in the ark, and they did not know till the flood came and took all away, so it shall also be in the presence of the Son of Man. Just like it was then, it will be now. They're not looking for anything else, so they're not going to see anything else. How well am I noticing more than what's just in front of me? Because the scriptures are telling us those who don't notice more than what's just in front of them are going to miss. They're going to miss seeing the larger picture. And we, brethren, have to make sure that our eyes are tuned to more than just what just might be right in front of me. And Brother David gave us many viewpoints of how prophecies have been fulfilled here at the end of the age. And I'll tell you, just want to highlight just one because it just, it, it's an amazing thing to me. You know, the kings have had their day. And to see the history of all of those kings and read how at that, in that one year, there were 12 of them, I was counting as he was going through, that were deposed. They're done. It's over. Coincidence or prophetic fulfillment? You see, if we watch and we see, then you can take care of and put the mocking in place and say, you just got to understand the depth of what's already there. What manner of people should we be in our sacred conduct and reverence? See, brethren, the theme for the convention is lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. We live in a day, a very fearful and wonderful day. And the bottom line of it all is the redemption is right in front of us. And we have to do our work. Let's get back to 2 Peter 3, 7. But by his word in the present heavens and the present earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So the world that was destroyed by water, world that is, the present heavens and earth, heavens and earth are being reserved for fire. As dramatic as the destruction of the previous order was, the destruction of the present order, according to Peter, is that much more comprehensive. The flood showed the removal of all of the infrastructure and the destruction of all in accord with it. The symbolic fire at this end of the age implies the complete destruction of all world government's infra infrastructure, as well as the death of all its supports. It's a major, major overhaul. If you want to build a new structure on a site, you have to have the last remnants of the old thing taken away. There is no, 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 uh, no congruity between the two of them. When we go back to, and we'll just touch on this, Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and Brother Harry had mentioned this, uh, is, it made very plain. In Daniel 2, verses 34 to 35, you continued to look until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on the feet of iron and of clay and crushed them. And you've got that mixture that's weak, 
because it, 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 it's, not, it's, not, it, it's not made of something solid like the stone that, that God's kingdom is built upon. Then the iron, the clay, and the bronze, and the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found, but the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. In that one vision, in those few lines of interpretation, you have a summation of where we get to live and what we get to see. And in Daniel 2, 44 and 45, it says, in the days of those kings, this is Daniel's interpretation, the kings of the God of the, uh, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. This is what we see when we look. Even compared to the desolation of Jerusalem and the temple back in AD 70, this fire that we are seeing now uh, form will shake both heavens and earth. Just a quick look back there, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 to 29, going back to that point in time, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those uh, who did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, this is God's message through Jesus in his first advent, much less will we now escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. So you had the warning of the desolation of Jerusalem, and there was no escape. And his voice shook the earth then. It was a shaking experience then. But now he has promised, saying, and, 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 and the apostle in Hebrews quotes from Haggai 2.6, yet once, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. So this is much bigger than that. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. And continue in Hebrews, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. The heavens and the earth are now shaken. And brethren, here we live. Here we sit in this comfortable room, in comfortable fellowship, with comfortable refreshments, while outside, the world is changing before our very eyes. I think it was Brother Bob who talked about something happening in the news this weekend. It is moving forward as we fellowship. And it's not for us to just look at it and say, look at how God's plans are unfolding. It's for us to look at ourselves and ask the question, the question, what manner of people should I be in my sacred conduct and reverence. What must I do each and every day to be faithful, to be faithful to sacrifice? Because you are part of the prophecies. You understand that, right? You are part of what all of these big things are. And prophecy doesn't continue until certain pieces are finished. And the finishing of the church is what's before us. Are we made of the spiritual materials needed that cannot be shaken? Are we? Think about that in terms of our lives.
Continuing in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to, 9, uh, 8 to 9, Peter continues, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. This is a very strong literal reminder, okay, a day with God is a very long time in human reckoning because it takes too long from the human perspective. And so Peter, when he's talking about the world that was and the, and, the, and, the, and the heavens and the earth being dissolved by fire, he's saying, you got to understand, this is a long process. And from God's perspective, it's all moving along at a, an appropriate pace. But from our perspective, it's like, wow, you'd think, you'd, you'd think it'd be over by now. Verse 9, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not desiring for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. A beautiful promise of what restitution comes to be. Our Father, our Heavenly Father, is always exactly on time with his timing. As we observe these prophecies and the world events unfolding around us, we need to embrace submission to his timing. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. I will stand upon my watch. And remember, let me just back up. In Habakkuk, in the first chapter, he is complaining to God. Have you noticed the mess that we're in? Have you been seeing what's happening? How we're being overrun? Why aren't you doing something? And Habakkuk is really letting God know how he feels. And his reaction in chapter 2 is, okay, now I'm going to stand on my watch, and I'm going to set, be, uh, be set on the tower and watch to see what he will say to me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. So this is, a beautiful, this is a beautiful lesson for us. He let his heart be poured out before God. And he says, now that I have said it, I'm going to back up. I am going to watch, and I will see how the Lord reproves me and shows me what I just don't understand. And brethren, sometimes we have to get on that watchtower ourselves and look and say, Lord, show me what I'm not able to see. Help me understand. And here's what he was told. Verse 2, and the Lord answered me. And he said, and we all know these verses. Look at the chart of the ages. Write the vision. Make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is not yet for an appointed time. I'm sorry, for vision is yet for an appointed time which means a fixed time or season. But the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, though it hesitates, though it waits, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. It will not loiter. It will not procrastinate. In other words, it will, re it will arrive exactly, precisely on time. And if that timing feels too big for you, Take heart in the fact that I, God, know the timing. And in my mind, in my plan, it is precise. So then we can adjust to that precision. What manner of people should we be in our sacred conduct and reverence? Because the timing takes a long time. And I've said this to many brethren in, in, in the past. Uh, in, when I was a teenager, growing up as a, a Bible student, I was 15 and 16 years old. Um, you know, we were told uh, there's no time to get married and have a family. Well, I'm 66, and it's 50 years later. And you look at that and you say, okay, there was time. But at the same point, there wasn't. And you know why? Because the urgency of what a consecrated life must be doesn't say, I've got all this time to plan for it. It says, what must I do today to be faithful, to be, live that consecrated life today? Continuing, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 11. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Such, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, and here's the question, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct 
and godliness. So the question here, or I'm sorry, the statement that the, the apostle is making is, this is what's going to happen. The heavens will pass away with a roar. It's not going easily. The elements will be destroyed with an intense heat. You're going to see it. It's going to be dramatic. And the earth and its works will be burned up. There's no question about this. There's no, well, maybe it was destroyed, but maybe it wasn't. Let's re-examine. Once the work of destroying the, 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 uh, the, the world of Satan is complete, there is no question by anybody at any level for any reason to say, what just happened? It's very, very obvious. It's very plain. That's, that's the message that Peter is giving us. We know that the day of the Lord did come as a thief. We also know that the current unfolding and destruction of the present systems is quiet and under the surface to most. And I'll explain that in a minute. By grace, uh, by God's spirit and by prophecy, we see more than they see, and yet we do not know how all the details will unfold. There is so much happening, and you know, we here in the United States look at things from the, state, the, the perspective of uh, a, a citizen of the United States. Somebody in, in Canada, in, in this hemisphere, sees it this way. Brethren who live in India, for instance, are going to see things from a different perspective because their world works a little bit differently. But when we all look at it from the standpoint of the world in which we live, what do they see? They see the, 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 the political arguing to say we can make it better. This is going to work. This is going to work this time. That's, forget that. Those people are stupid because you know, there's a lot of mocking going on. This is going to be the way. And what we need to be able to do, brethren, in all cases, is rise above all of that and not be a part of any of it because it's all doomed to fall apart. And it falls apart from the inside out. Doesn't meet, meet any outside provocation. It falls apart from the inside out. In Psalm 102, 24 to 28, it says, I said, oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. This is referring to Jesus. Your years are throughout all generations. Of old, you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. This is a wonderful psalm of praise. And then it says, they will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them, and they will be changed. This, these are the things, brethren, we need to see and we need to hold on to in the midst of all of our prophetic study and observation and thought and, and work. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. The children of your servants will continue, and their descendants will be established before you. So it's a prophecy that says, God, you have created this magnificent creation, and you will change it. You will make it so that what you originally put in place will be what will be for eternity. And the stuff in the middle by definition, has to be changed. It has to be reworked. And whenever you do that, it's costly. And brethren, our lives as consecrated individuals have to be changed. They have to be reworked. They have to be refocused. They have to, to, be, to be put in that place that says, what must I do today? That is what we're really wanting to focus on. What manner of people should we be in our sacred conduct and reverence? How well and how humbly are we studiously observing the unfolding of events without impatiently expecting what we expect? It's really easy to look at the circumstances and to have that, that expectation. You know, I mentioned to you when I was 15 or 16 um, some of the things that, that I, was, I, was, I was told growing up in, in, in the truth. And I, I want to finish that, that, that story. I was talking to Brother David Stein at lunch about this, and he had mentioned you know, several prophetic events that had happened. One was the 1967 war. And you look at that event, and I was nine years old when that happened. And you look at that event, and I remember my parents talking about it. And I remember, <laughs> I remember my dad reading headlines 
and laughing about what had happened and how quickly it had ended. I, didn't, I wasn't sure what was happening, but wait, there's a war and you're laughing? It was because it was so fast. And it, see, it was so obviously guided by the Lord's hand. And I look at that event, and I, and, and I realize that the brethren who were adults, I'm a kid, they were adults at that time, saw this and said, the Lord's hand is plainly, outwardly, obviously on Israel. The time is accelerating. And they were right. They were right. They were right. Sometimes the Lord's acceleration just takes longer than we think. But I look at that and I can appreciate the intensity with which they saw that experience and said, this is obvious. And it was, and it is, and will always be. Let's continue. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. Looking for and hastening, which means awaiting eagerly, the coming or the parousia of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we're looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, brethren, have told you all about this. They've talked to you about the falling down and the putting down and the putting away and the destruction, and they've talked about the new heavens and the new earth. This new heavens and new earth cannot flourish in the presence of the current heaven and earth. The two don't mix. And just a sidelight, before we get back to the, just the, the, the prophetic viewpoint, brethren, in our consecrated life, our flesh is only to be the housing of the new creature until such time as we are faithful and we can be rid of it. But in the meantime, we want to, as best as we can, not have the spirit mixing with the flesh. In the prophecies that the brethren have talked about and will probably be talking about in the, in the panel discussions tomorrow is the, 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 the concept of coming out of Babylon, coming out of the heresies and the misrepresentations and running only towards pure spirituality and not stopping along the way in the middle. That's part of what we are called to be. Brethren, that's part of our prophecy. Many of you did not come out of Babylon. I didn't. But I have to, as a consecrated individual, stay away from those compromises. Because my part, by God's grace, relies on being faithful unto death as a footstep follower of Christ. The two can't flourish together. New heavens and new earth won't work. Isaiah 45, 18 to 19. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. New heavens and new earth, put the old away. There is none else. I have not spoken in secret in some dark land. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in a waste place. I, the Lord, speak righteousness, declaring things that are upright. I have said it. I have showed you. I have unfolded it over time. And the work that I have started will absolutely be completed. That's the power behind the prophecies. This new heavens and new earth, by definition, have to bring a destruction, a destructive process. Jeremiah 51, 24 to 26. But I will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea for, uh, for all their evil that they have done in Zion before your eyes, declares the Lord. Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain who destroys the whole earth, declares the Lord. If that's not an apt picture of, 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 of satanic influence. I don't know what is. Oh, destroying mountain that destroys the whole earth. This destroying civil power over the civil powers that destroys all of the earth. I am against you. I will stretch out my hand against you and roll down you down from the crags and I will make you a burnt out mountain. 
How badly will this mountain be destroyed? They will, this is verse 26, they will not take from you even a stone for a corner, nor a stone, nor a stone for foundations, but you will be desolate forever, declares the Lord. Once the present heavens and earth are done being destroyed, there is nothing worthwhile to use to build something new. It has to be reduced to complete rubble. Praise God that it's reduced because that way all vestiges of sin and evil are gone. This new heavens and new earth bring a cleansing of all humanity from sin. And Isaiah 66 verses 22 to 24. For just as the new heavens and new earth, which I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure, and it shall be from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath. All mankind will come to down, bow down before me, says the Lord. Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men whom they, who have transgressed before me, for their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched and there will be an, abhor an abhorrence to all mankind. That doesn't sound very pleasant. But what it is, is the necessary reminder that once this, head, this old heaven and earth are destroyed, the remembrances of it will always be intact to show that darkness and disloyalty to God Almighty on any level only produce death and destruction. You need the remembrance. Third, this new heavens and new earth uh, will establish a new and permanent reality for all of humanity. Isaiah 65, verses 17 to 22. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem. Why? For rejoicing, and her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people, and there will no longer be heard in her the voices of weeping and the sound of crying. No longer will there be in it any infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his days for the youth will die at the age of 100 and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. They will build houses and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people and my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. So in this prophecy to Isaiah, God Almighty is saying, I will rejoice in my people and I will work them through the growing from what they were into what they need to be. And I will give them such earthly blessing that they will have what they, will, what they need. They will work and rejoice in their work and one will build and inhabit it will be, each will be able to take care of themselves because I will give them exactly what I gave them at the very beginning. This new heavens and this new earth must push aside permanently all else. So the question is, we know this. You know what the question is. What manner of people should we be and our sacred conduct and reverence sacred conduct and reverence understand brethren that sacred conduct doesn't just show up when you go to a convention it doesn't show up when you go to a zoom meeting or meet with your with your brethren in your home ecclesia sacred conduct is what drives the new creature. Do I pay attention to that sacred conduct in a reverential way? This is our redemption being revealed. Lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. How long is it going to be till the church is complete? I have no idea. I don't know. The more relevant question is, what am I going to do today to serve the Lord with my, all my heart, 
mind, soul, and strength? That's the more relevant question. And if I serve him today and tomorrow and the next day, everything beyond is in his hands. I can take heart in the present service because I, am, I can't figure out the future. All I can do is serve in the present. Continuing in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Be found by him, spotless and blameless. In this epistle, Peter's already given us the practical application of faithful living so we can handle the challenges of the prophetic part of faithful living. The promises are waiting to be claimed. Why? So we can live faithfully in trying times. Brethren, the finishing of the church is likely not going to be an easy thing. You know, what kind of persecution may we face? I don't know. But I do know this, that whatever it is, whatever it might be, if we focus on daily living up to our consecration vows, come what may, because that puts us in a position to handle whatever the Lord has in store. 2 Peter 1, 3 to 5, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and God, I interrupted myself, <laughs> seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Everything pertaining to life. He's given you everything that you possibly would need to be faithful. For by these things, he has granted to us, verse 4, his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world by lust. Not only does he give us all of these hundreds and hundreds of prophecies. And not only does he give us divine direction and instruction of how to live and the example of Jesus and all those things, he gives us promises to hold on to so that when we get into a situation where we feel overwhelmed, we can take this promise and say, you gave this to me and you mean what you say. So now I can take what you've given me and say, please help me with what you've given me. We're to take these promises and directly apply them to living fully consecrated lives. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Let's continue. Now, for this very reason all, all also, apply all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, supply knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And your brotherly kindness, love. See how it builds? And you get to agape love. Because that's the end result. You know you've passed from death unto life because... And what love is that? That's agape love a new commandment that I give you. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, if these things are in you and you're discouraged because there's a trial that's just heavy, but you're working on these things, this scripture just told you that if you have these things and you're working on them, you are not rendered useless or unfruitful. You're just going through a rough spot. Have faith. Hold the promises. Take the next step. What manner of persons ought we to be in our sacred reverence? Brethren, life is hard. Sacrifice is costly. We need stone-cold determination as we move forward, as we see these things happening around us. Second Peter, again, chapter 2. Let's go to verses 9 through 11. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing for you, to make your calling and election sure. Be all the more diligent. 
For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. You won't have to wonder where the doorway is. It will be shown to you because of the faithfulness that we work to apply each and every day. As we watch, pray, we anticipate what faithfulness will look like for the glorified church. What we see is they will be joined with Jesus in glorifying God in all places and in every way. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Brethren, be thou faithful unto death. And you're part of that new Jerusalem. It comes down unto, from heaven to the earth. You're part of this incredibly unfathomable, glorious picture of grace and God's strength in everything. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now this is not just any voice, it's a loud voice. How many times in Revelation does it say a loud voice? And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell among them they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, for the former things have passed away. That is in the context of the faithfulness of the church coming down as New Jerusalem from heaven to bless all the families of the earth. This convention is about the prophecies at these end times. The purpose of these prophecies is to bring us to that. Your part is to be faithful today. And when you wake up tomorrow, it's to be faithful tomorrow. John chapter 9, verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. There comes a time when our opportunities may well be shut down. Brother Bob was alluding to that. What does that look like? I don't know. But I do know this. That while it is day and while we have breath, and while we have opportunity, in the light of all of these prophecies and all of these things unfolding and these things crashing and burning and these things being built up and putting all of this together, what am I supposed to do? What manner of people should we be in our sacred conduct and reverence? What manner of people? And just very, very quickly, a, a quick little personal, very, very short rendition of a personal story Many of you know about my experience with uh, blood clots and um, being in the hospital <laughs> in a very surprised situation. I'd never, I had never, I, I rarely get sick, and there I am sitting in the hospital, and they're telling me, if you didn't come in this week, you probably would have died next week. And it was just this mind, mind-blowing circumstance. And I remember being in the hospital, like, what just happened? And my wife had had COVID. I didn't, but so they, you know, this was in 2022 and, and they, and they put you like miles away from everybody else if you're exposed to COVID. So I'm sitting in this, in this hospital room, in this hospital, and there's nobody around, it seems like for miles. And I'm laying in this bed with the, with the blood thinner stuff going into, the heparin going into my arm. And I'm laying there and I'm looking up thinking, I was just spared because I had no idea. If it was left up to me, I would not have gone to the hospital would not have gone, ask my wife, wouldn't have gone. It took her and our daughter, who's an APRN, insisting that I go, and I'm like, come on, this is ridiculous. And anyway, I'm laying in the bed, realizing that the Lord had just extended my opportunity. I looked up, 
and I said, what will you have me do? Because I realized that it's borrowed time. Got out of the hospital the next day. Went back to life as it was, except that in the next two weeks, there were these massive opportunities, some challenging, some wonderful, some scary, that came before me. I had been feeling overwhelmed beforehand, like I can't do any more. The Lord said, oh, you think not, huh? And he stopped me and he made me lay down, face my own mortality, and basically say, just trust me. Trust me and take the next steps. And that little experience completely changed my sense to a higher level of what consecration is. And I urge you, brethren, to ask that question. Lord, what will you have me do? And then look for his answer. Because prophecy hangs on the development and the completion and the faithfulness of the last of the church. Be thou faithful unto death, and he will give us crowns of life. May the Lord add his blessing.